All right. So, uh, fair disclaimer, I'm completely agnostic on this issue as in terms of what these emissions would mean. This is just a secondary result of the modeling that we did. The primary result is the economic stuff that I just showed you. And I'll also note, you know, strict apolitical you know, nonpartisan apolitical is Remy, we're about our model, we have clients on both sides of the aisle, we have NEA, we have AGA, we have the National Federation of Independent Business, they're all around this town, and I know them all pretty well. Um, but here's what happens to emissions. Right now, American emissions are about 500 million, 5,000 million, so 5 billion, um, 5 billion metric tons. Maybe a little bit more than that. The data is not in for 2013 and 2014. I actually suspect this is going to be a little bit underestimation when we're done, but that's the idea. The baseline that USDOE puts out says that our emissions are going to be basically flat from now until the 2030s. A little bit of curve in there, but for the most part, it's essentially flat. What our simulation says is when you actually go through and do it, and this is a couple effects, two primary ones. One is we change the coal, uh, we change the power generation mixture. So we're changing over from fossil plants into renewable plants. And two, we're disincentivizing people to purchase fossil energy because it's more expensive. So households and businesses. And this is when you actually rack it up in terms of carbon dioxide, what happens. It's about 33% by 2025, and it's almost quite 50% by 2035. So this is just a consequence of the fiscal reform. It's not even officially a goal or a necessary premise of the fiscal reform, but this is the consequence of it. Um, you all probably know better than me how to contextualize this in terms of world emissions, in terms of national emissions, but this obviously would be fairly significant, you know, 50% in the next 20 years. Here's the revenues on the carbon tax. Um, two points to be made here. One, it's a lot of money. Um, like almost absurd amounts. Humans cannot comprehend these funds. I can't for that matter. Um, $600 billion in, by 2035 or so. Uh, the federal budget right now in terms of total revenues is about $3 trillion or so, at least individual income taxes. So it's not of that scale, but it's the next order down. This is more than federal excise taxes. This is way more than the corporate income tax. Um, so that's the first point. It's a lot of money. Second point is notice its shape. It's that logarithmic curve, but it's not like upsy downsy. It's not a frowny face. It doesn't come back to zero. At least within the time horizon that we're talking about, because we're constantly increasing the rate, emissions aren't at zero. The goal is, of course, zero. At least I think that is the goal eventually. But because emissions are going down, but the rate is going up, the actual revenues are quote unquote robust. This is a revenue source that's somewhat dependable, at least in our time horizon, for whatever the feds want to do with it. Um, it would eventually tip over. You would essentially see that frowny curve, but it's going to be in a longer time horizon than we have at least. Um, but of course, this is not actually tax revenue for the government. This is not going to the general fund. This is not going to the Social Security Trust Fund. This goes into the rebate fund. This goes into the United States version of the Alaska Permanent Fund. Here's what people get back. And this is by family. I, I imagine the standard family of four, two adults, two children. I could do it by per capita, by individual, but I figured this was a good way to contextualize it. And remember, it's monthly. So put it in context of your mortgage payment or your car payments. It starts low, about 50 bucks a month. And by the time at the end of the time horizon, it's about $400 per month. Um, and again, it's the same concept, it's robust. And it's actually slightly growing faster for families because our economy tends to go faster than our demographics do. So it actually gets bigger in a, a proportional sense over time for each individual family. So this is what people would actually get back. Um, and I'll note, I'm, I'm putting this in everything, but this is all in real dollars, it's all inflation adjusted. So this isn't, you know, the average income in the United States in 2050 will be half a million dollars or a million dollars, but in real terms it won't be nearly that much because that, most of that's inflation. So this is all in real dollars. This is as if it was done right now or as if it was done in 2012. So it's a real dollars concept. Here's what happens to the cost of living. This is a, one of the big criticisms of something like this is going to be, is that it increases the cost of living for individuals inside the economy. And we have a price index. We have a CPL inside the model. So I'm like, all right, I'll just look at it. Um, and it's about 2%. It makes the cost of living in total, in terms of price, is about 2% higher. Um, for context, say an average family spends 10% of their income on energy, you double that cost, you now all of a sudden have made this a couple percent higher. So it's not a tremendous impact. It is slightly negative, but it is not tremendous relative to a baseline. If anything, the way to think about this, 2% is basically an annual, is basically one year of inflation. It's as if we have one extra year of inflation between now and 2035. It's 1 20th of what our inflation would be otherwise. 
Here's real income per capita. This is different from GDP. This is household income. This is part of GDP, but it's only what goes to households. And this is the net of the dividend, the additional jobs, because those jobs have wages behind them, divided by the higher cost. This does assume that higher cost does hurt real income. And on a per capita basis, 220.35, again, it's the same kind of shape we've been seeing, but it's $500 to $800 or so, relatively speaking. So imagine everyone in this room, imagine all your spouses, all your children, all your family members. Roughly speaking, household income would be about $800 higher for all of you. After the dividend, after more people having jobs who wouldn't have had otherwise, and then also adjusting for the fact that you have to pay more for energy and other commodities because of it. Anyway. Annually. This is definitely an annual number. If it's per month, yeah, that's a big number. Um, the, only, the only monthly figure in the entire report is actually this one, just for clarity's sake. And notice I do labels monthly here. And it's an annual model, so it's just you know, that message. All right, now, power generation. This is for what I like to affectionately call the wattheads in the room. The left is our baseline. This is what Reed said is going to happen if we don't do anything, quote unquote. Um, Orange is natural gas, red is nuclear power, blue is coal. And then the stuff at the top, the lime green color, is wind, and the gold color is solar. Um, there's also the white color in the middle, um, kind of top middle. That's hydro, which actually is not going to change very much because we're kind of out of rivers. We can add a little bit, but for the most part, we damn what we can. We've gotten all this, the feet that we can. So that's the baseline. Coal persists. Um, Nuclear is declining because the plants aren't being renewed, eventually they're just being retired slowly. Gas is expanding to kind of take up what nuclear is dropping, and there's a little bit extra wind and solar. That was the orange dot you saw earlier in Kansas and Iowa. Now, alternative. Coal is not economical. It is not competitive on the grid by the 2020s. And In its place is wind, for the most part, as you can see. You also have a decent amount extra nuclear. And I know that's a complicated history of the environmental movement. I'm just going to assume that uh, th this model is based on cost. It's not based on regulatory hurdle. It's not based on public relations. It's based on the economics alone. So nuclear makes economic sense. So what you can imagine now is our power system now is almost two-tiered. We have plants that are run 100% of the time as base load, and we have plants that are turned on and off as they're needed. Those plants are basically coal and gas. They sometimes switch each other's role, but that's basically what happens. That is what keeps going on in our baseline. What happens in the alternative is now we have three classes. We have variable power, which is wind and solar. There are days when wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. We have base load, which is essentially hydro and nuclear. That is run 100% of the time, close to 100% capacity. And then we have gas that fills up the middle. Gas will definitely still be part of the mixture. There's going to be more sequestration of that gas. Um, based on the DOE data, they say it's economical at these price of carbon levels. Those are the peak plants. They're going to be run basically a couple days in the middle of the summer when it's really hot and people are running their air conditioners. Um, they do emit, and you have to pay a heavy carbon tax because of that, but they're really cheap and they cycle incredibly well. And they're also, in some senses, going to be kind of the opposite of the wind. If you have a giant wind farm in western Iowa and you have a windless day, you might run a gas plant that day to make up the difference. So those two are going to be kind of cycling with each other while the hydro and the nuclear takes the face of this. And just to point this out to everyone is notice, solar, wind, biofuels, geothermal, hydro, sequestered gas, and nuclear, all are basically zero carbon or very, very close to zero carbon sources. There's only a little bit of gas left that's actually emitting. There's three coal plants in Pennsylvania that we actually had surviving. Um, so it's not completely gone, but for the most part. But this is what we see happening to our power grid. It makes economic sense to do what's on the right instead of on the left because of this carbon tax that we have it. I'm getting into demographics. Uh, I went through with our friends at Synapse and I calculated, because when you shut a coal plant down, you're shutting a lot of NOx and SOx down. When you sell less gallons of gasoline, you're getting less emissions from tailpipes. Um, and the monetary figures are there. I wanted to put them there to be completely upfront with the way this is being assessed. When you go through and you calculate out, this is the benefit cost. This is the air quality benefit of reductions in carbon emissions. This is what kind of comes along for the ride. It's not an intentional part of the policy, but it's a secondary effect. Um, notice the big ones here are in the red and the green, which is the Great Lakes and the Great Plains states, which have 
most of the coal plants in the United States. Um, because those coal plants are being shut down, and we have regional results for all the stuff inside the white paper, so you can see this graph for your region if you want to see it. Um, but because the coal plants are mostly shut down in West, South, Central, West, North, Central, and East, North, Central, this is where most of the air quality benefits actually take place. So Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, uh, Nebraska, the Dakotas, all that area. Um, you get a little bit in some other parts of the country, but not as much. Um, no offense to the New Englanders and the Californians in the room, but because you've already, in a large extent, decarbonized your power generation profile, there's not much benefit here, simply because, again, uh, most of the Pacific stuff is actually tailpipes. It's congestion and smog in Los Angeles that's being saved in this case, um, as opposed to coming from full stacks. Now, if you calculate this as a safe premature death, um, you can say save lives, I think it was more of a safe premature death, that's the way it literally is interpreted. Um, if you divide the air quality benefit by 6.2 million, which is a pretty standard benefit cost value for a human life in federal calculations, that's what the USDOT uses, what OSHA uses, what EPA uses, it's maybe a little low for some of those, but it's USDOT's number, and you add it up over time, it's roughly speaking 230 million lives. Over the course of 20 years, it's about 11,000 a year, but over the course of 20, 30 years, because we have a lot less of this stuff, NOx, SOx, mercury, all that, we have a lot less respiratory illnesses, and this is roughly speaking what it comes out as. Let me find a couple points here. Um, Believe it or not, because you have so many extra jobs in the upper Midwest, again, the red and the green, building wind farms, and because you have such higher quality of life there, because you get rid of coal plants, this is where actually the population concentrates itself. So again, I'm a native Iowan. The state could have a couple hundred, maybe 100,000 people out of something like this, but again, the upper Midwest, which has tended to be the place where people have moved out historically, because this carbon tax is good for, relatively speaking, their industries and their power generation and their air quality, that's where actually most of the population ends up reloading. So there's a little bit of decline in the southern part of the country and the western part of the country as a consequence. Again, California has no coal plants to shut down, or very few. Um, but it does matter actually for regional population. And in the long term, this matters for economics. Because when a person moves, they take themselves, they take their labor, they take their demand, they take their family's labor and demand. Um, you have a million people to the area between the Quad Cities and Youngstown, Ohio. That's a lot of houses that got to get built. And that ends up in the jobs and the GDP results that we're seeing here. So here's the summary of the results. I don't think there's an industry in here, unless it was already losing output, that actually does, it actually shrinks. It's just relative to a baseline, relative to where things would have gone otherwise. It's 70 to 90 billion in GDP, which is actually much less impressive than the job number, but remember why that is. It's because it's in labor-intensive, service, consumer spending centric, centric sectors that are getting most of the demand and spending. Climate. Um, significant is just my generic disclaimer word for I think those are significant, they're pretty big percentages, um, but it's large emissions. The revenue is $600 billion, which you could do a lot of tax reform with, or in your guys' case, you could do a lot of rebates with. It's $200 by 10 years, 20 years from now, it's almost $400 for a family per month, so it's, you know, it goes from $200, so maybe it's a low car payment, to $400, so now it's, it's a large car payment or a small mortgage payment um, by the 2030s. Electricity. The coal fleet is, like I said, not competitive by the 2020s. Um, the model's making economic decisions, therefore they are shut down and they're replaced by wind and solar for variable power, a little bit of geothermal. Um, and I know this is, again, the environmental movement's been conflicted about this for 30, 40 years, but a lot of nuclear is going to replace the same role that coal has in the grid of being run all the time. At these level of carbon taxes, coal uh, nuclear plants actually are competitive, despite the fact they are very expensive. And then demographics. Uh, it's that 230 million number. If you do it annually, it's 11 to 13,000. And the best part of the country in my book, the Midwest, open, green, happy, friendly. <laughs> Gets more people. It's always been a trade off. And I remember watching uh, Vice President Gore and Governor Bush in 2000. You can watch Mitch McConnell and uh, Lisa McCarthy, uh, I forget her first name, but McCarthy from UV, uh, EPA argue about this kind of stuff now. It's Gene, Gene McCarthy. It's always good for the environment, but it's bad for the economy. And the problem here is it's always been looked at as a regulatory issue, a command and control issue. It's never been looked at as a tax issue. This is a tax reform study, first and foremost. The environmental stuff, again, is an accident that comes along with it. It's an indirect effect. Um, when you look at these as tax reform, they don't necessarily have to come off that way. Think of this as a tax swap away from taxing income capital 
towards taxing energy or taxing emissions. Not energy, not, we're not taxing renewable energy, we're taxing emissions. When you do it that way, that quote unquote infernal trade off, that the, this could be bad for the economy, and they're not wrong in a lot of cases. If you do things and you're not encompassing the losers, if you're not bringing any revenue in, it can be bad for the economy, and it has been in a lot of cases. Um, it also, and this is kind of the standard game theory, and I've had this response plenty of times, is people always say, well, okay, maybe we save emissions here, but the Chinese are just going to make up the difference in a week. And they're not in necessarily a lot of cases wrong. But notice what goes on here is, this is good for our economy, what the rest of the world is doing is irrelevant. The prisoner's dilemma, the, the, the game theory of this doesn't matter anymore, because our optimal strategy is to do it anyways, it doesn't matter what they do. And because of that border adjustment, And again, because of that border adjustment, there's actually an incentive for other countries to get on board, is that they want us to stop taxing their imports. Um, and we're a huge market. We're the hugest market there is in this world. Uh, if they want that, they have to start getting on board with some sort of equivalent system. Um, so it has some diplomatic and geopolitical effects on that side as well. Um, as I said a million times in this, and I'm staying away from the climate issues, I'm a trained economic modeler, I'm not a climate modeler, I'm not a climate scientist or geoscientist or anything like that. My brother is, but not me. Um, <laughs> the motive for why we want to do this is relevant. The model does not know why all of a sudden I'm making energy so much more expensive. It just knows that I am and I'm taking the money and putting it elsewhere. So the motivation for why you want to do this doesn't matter. It's a tax reform study. And then the last part about it is because this is not, it's not really a tax reform study. I kind of think of it as almost a fourth way. Um, the United States, you know, current, the government is almost two complete separate systems that are interrelated, but theoretically separate. One is the general tax code, which brings money in and spends it. One is the, essentially the social welfare system, which uses payroll taxes to bring money in and gives it back out for Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. In theory, they're supposed to be self-financing and not cross over on each other. They're not obvious, but in theory, they're supposed to. In some senses, this creates a third system that's entirely separate from each of them, that does not change anything about tax and spend, so there's no argument there, it's no tax and spend. It doesn't do anything to the general tax code. You don't have to answer anything about, uh, again, Ryan's budget, Camp's budget, anything like that. It has nothing to do with any of that. It doesn't increase spending. I, again, I assumed out that there wouldn't be an administrative cost, but you know, relative to the size of the dollar share, it wouldn't be large. So there's no tax and spend. And it's not changing the social entitlement system. There are European countries that have put their carbon tax into financing their social security program and their social welfare programs. Not in this case. It's going straight back to households, just like Alaska does it um, monthly. It's based on the carbon tax revenue. All these issues, and the, these are maniacal issues. This is why this town isn't getting anything done. There are some very hard choices that are going to be made be made, they're going to have to make over the next 10, 20 years about the general tax code, about spending on the whole defense and non-defense, and then of course about Social Security and Medicaid. There are some very big shortfall there. So we're going to have to make some changes to make up for. None of that has anything to do with this carbon fee and dividend. This is its own system that stands for its own sake. Why we want to do it doesn't matter, and what the rest of the world wants to do or what the rest of the world would do because of this is actually irrelevant because it's an optimal strategy for us by ourselves. Canada, Germany, Australia, Japan, China, India, actually doesn't matter in this case. Yes, they may continue to admit, yes, they may actually wash out a lot of these benefits from a climate standpoint, but we can do this without them saying anything back to us. It doesn't matter to us. And then we can actually engage on them about maybe doing something on their side as well, because we're now we're taxing their imports in a way the WTO might allow. So that's basically it.